The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to another biology lesson for Lower Six Science. I'm your teacher, biology teacher, Dama Charles Bobga. Uh, before we get into the lesson, we're going to make a review of the assignment that you were given last time. And that assignment was for you to describe the practical steps that you can use to make your soup at home. And the correction of the assignment, we will look at first, uh, why should you make your soap at home? Why don't go to a supermarket and buy your soap? The first reason is that you can personalize the, the shape and the fragrance of your soap bar. So sometimes people are attracted by the shape of the soap. They are attracted by the smell of the soap. And sometimes the supermarket and the commercial centers, you can see that. So you can easily uh, uh, make your own uh, soap of shape and fragrance. You always know exactly to what ingredients you've added into the into the soap sometimes you buy the soap and what is written upon the on the on the soap level may not be exactly what they have they have used so in this case you are sure that you have added the ingredients that you know now hope made soap therefore will be more friendly gentle on the skin and will not have the desirable chemicals that will make commercial soap some commercial soaps very dangerous what will you need? You will, you will need, before you start making your soap, you will need to have a recipe written down. Recipe are the steps that are the, and the things that you will need and the steps you will take in the production of your homemade soap. Uh, this will help you uh, to know the ingredients, to know the oils, to know exactly uh, what you will do and the various additions that you require for your production. Now, let's talk about the ingredients. Ingredients are those items that you will need, that would be components of your soap. And the first ingredient will be the oils. Now you get the solid oil, the oil can be solid, the oil can be liquid. Solid oils will be coconut oil, shea butter, the liquid oils will be olive, sunflower oil. And then, second, uh, thirdly, you will have to need a strong alkaline solution. And the alkaline solution here is potassium hydroxide. And there's a special commission name given to that potassium hydroxide. We call it the lye. You need distilled water, you need essential oils, and perhaps some other colorants. Do you like your soap to have a particular color, or do you like it to have some, some, some medicinal value? You can add dry herbs. Now you need utensils. You need to have a kitchen scale. You can weigh the components. You need to have a container that you will use to weigh the potassium hydroxide or the lye. You need a container for mixing the water and the lime, mixing the water and the, and, the, and the base. You need a container for weighing the oils. I need a saucepan that you use to heat the solid oil to, be, to liquid before you use. Now you need a thermometer. You need a hand blender. You need a spatula. A spatula will just be a spoon-like structure that you can use to carry a substance to put in your mixture. You need one spoon for mixing the lime water and for mixing the oil. You need a mold. A mold would be a metal shape or something that you can put your, 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 your mixture of, uh, uh, to, to have a desired shape that you want. You need protective uh, wear on your body. Now remember that because you are dealing with a corrosive chemical, potassium hydroxide, you need a safety strategy. And because potassium hydroxide is highly co 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 corrosive and can burn your skin, Always wear your protective uh, device 
uh, when you're making your shoe, let the shirt that you wear be long sleeve, so that if accidentally the potassium hydroxide falls on your shirt, it will not corrode your body. Put safety goggles, because by, by, by accident, the caustic soda, the potassium soda, um, hydroxide can flash into your ears. You wear rubber gloves in your hands, and you make your workspace more ventilated, so that uh, there should be escape of some gases. Now step one, melt and mix the oils. If the oil was solid, put it in your fry pan, melt it. So weigh your solid oil, melt them in a saucepan over low heat. That's the first thing. As you're, you're melting, you stir so that air bubbles can get out. Once the solid is melted, add the liquid oil to it and give it a stir again so that air should get out. And make sure you use a thermometer to maintain a temperature of 90 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. It's very important. You check the temp. Number two, it's the time to mix now the water and the caustic soda. And this step requires caution. Always put water first and then caustic soda or the lye second. Uh, add the distilled water to a container and then slowly add the caustic soda bit by bit until it's fully dissolved. Don't add in a rush. Never you pour water on the caustic soda because it's going to produce a violent reaction and dangerous reaction that can explode and burn your skin and produce dangerous forms that will hamper your respiratory system. So you must not mix, uh, 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 you must always put water first and then the caustic soda or the lye second. Now step three, mix the oils with the lye water. Remember that you've mixed the lye and, the, and the, uh, you've already mixed the lye and water, but now you need to mix it with the oil. So you mix now the oil with the lye water. So the mixture of water and the caustic soda. When the oil is mixed at right temperature, you can pour in the lye water, mixing it with a spoon until they are both incorporated. Incorporating that they are both homo, homogeneous. So that's very important. And then step four, bring the soap mix to trays. Uh, this means that you will use a hand blender to blend the mixture until it becomes a consistent mixture. It becomes a uniform mixture. And through this step, the lye, the caustic soda, the oils will begin to emulsify. And that process is called trace. Now in step five, you remember that the reason why you make your home-based soap is to make sure you get the shape of the soap that you like. So you may have made your container or you what they call uh, uh, a mold to the size and the, 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 the shape that you want. So this is the step that you now pour the soap into the mold, making sure to fill them to the top. Give the mold tray a gentle tap to get the rid of any air bubbles that might uh, be trapped inside. So as you put it inside the mold, begin to tap it so that the air bubbles come out. So, and then uh, you can add um, uh, to the mold, you can cover the mold with a film wrap it with a towel to maintain a residual heat and allow the sap saponification process to start. So it's at this stage that you allow the saponification that were done before to really take place to make sure that your soap is produced. Now you leave it to rest. As you cover it and allow the saponification to take place, do not touch it again. It usually takes about 24 hours for soap bars to harden. You can check them from, after, from time to time and if they, still, they still feel a bit soft, give them another day. So keep them as long as possible so that they harden to the texture that you want. So that is how you can make your, your homemade soup. Now your soap is ready and you can enjoy your homemade soap. You can be sure that the soap you are using will not corrode your body. You can be sure that the soap you are using is the soap that you have put the right ingredients. You can pass the soap and give it as gifts to your people. So that's a sample of a... A, a homemade soap. Look at the shape, look at the color because col colorants have been put and you can, uh, some are round, rectangular. So, you see that. But our focus of our lesson after this assignment, so I, I hope that you're going to practice you making your own soap. Give it a try and you, you perfect the process as you go, uh, you try it over and over. But the focus of our lesson today will still be on the biochemistry of lipids 3, but we're going to go higher, we're going to take you higher into the lesson. 
Remember, we have been taking the thing gradually, and our lesson plan is our normal lesson plan we have been seeing all the time. Uh, I will give you the objectives. I will, we will look at the prerequisite material, what you have learned before. We will look at the real-life practical situation. We will look at lesson activities and exercises, and then the assignment that you will have to do for next lesson. Now, what is the objective? Describe the structure of more complex lipids and their specific roles in living organisms. As you move from simple lipids, you go right to complex lipids, and their role in living organisms are different. So they have different roles to play in the living organism. What, uh, what do I expect you to have handy as information already? You already have an understanding of the chemical nature of simple lipids or simple triglycerides. So we are now talking about complex lipids. But that, that simple lipid will give you a foundation for you to understand complex uh, lipids now. So it is very important. Now, what real life situations can we be talking about? Complex lipids are used daily to make our lives easy. So we use complex lipids every day and we do not know that we are using them, but it makes our life uh, better each day. What is the scientific problem that we can f focus on? Without complex lipids, plasma membranes cannot function well. Remember that in the cell uh, walls of plants and animals, there is, the cells are protected by a plasma membrane. And that plasma membrane serves as, makes the cell an osmometer. It allows substance to pass through. So it beca it's because of the lipid content, as we're going to see, that intracellular transport and intercellular transport is possible. So we're going to see that plasma membranes have a lot of complex lipids and that's a handy problem. So our hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis we want to hang on now is that lipids are responsible for contributing to mem membrane tension, rigidity, and overall shape. So the membranes have that shape, the rigidity and the tension because of the constituent lipids. And the new hypothesis we are putting down is that lipids are not responsible. It's the contrary. Lipids are not responsible for the membrane tension, rigidity, and overall shape. So at the end, we're going to see whether it is the alternative hypothesis or the new hypothesis that stands. Some of the complex lipids we'll talk about includes phospholipids, steroids, glycolipids, and waxes. These are not all, but as you study the biochemistry of lipids into higher levels, you're going to see other complicated lipids that enter into the structure. Now let's talk about phospholipids. A phospholipid contains two fatty acid chains plus one phosphate head. Remember that in a normal triglyceride, the three fat, uh, uh, one uh, glycerol has three fatty acid chains. But in the case of phospholipid, one of them has been re replaced by a phosphate head. And these fatty chains are non-polar, hydrophobic, or water-fearing. And the phosphate heads are polar. And why are the phosphate heads, heads polar or water-loving? Uh, because they contain oxygens and they contain hydrogen. So they can be slightly, uh, 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 slightly positively charged or they can be slightly negatively charged. So the phosphate head is polar and then the hydrocarbon chain part is non-polar. So the, the hydrocarbon chain is hydrophobic or water-fearing and the phosphate head is polar, hydrophilic or water-loving. So it means that the phospholipid is a polarized molecule. So how are they formed? How are these phospholipids formed? Uh, I told you already that there is a glycerol molecule and instead of having three fatty acid uh, chains, as we saw in the case of triglycerides, only two fatty acid chains are there and then one of them is replaced by a phosphate. So we have two non-polar tails and, and uh, uh, made of the hydrocarbon and a polar tail made of the phosphate, uh, phosphate group. Now that's a typical structure of a phospholipid. Now if you look at here, this is the glycerol. This is the glycerol. And then these are two fatty acid chains. Remember that fatty acid chain can be saturated or non-saturated. And a third fatty acid chain was supposed to be in the third glycerol. But now it has been, take, it has been replaced by a phosphate group. Now if you look at that shape, you will see exactly how a phospholipid is. So that is a for, typical phospholipid because they contain uh, both hydrophobic 
because they contain both hydrophobic and hydrophilic. This is the hydrophilic. This is the hydrophobic. So this is the hydrophilic. This is the hydrophobic. We call them amphipatic. When a molecule has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic, it is described as amphipatic. Now, this complex uh, phospholipids, because of the phospholipids, they behave differently in water solution. Now, look at it. When a soap, because it has uh, a soap is placed in water, it forms measles. Look at it. What you have as balls are the hydrophilic part that will be in contact water, and what you have as cluster in the middle is the hydrophobic uh, ends that come together and surrounded by the hydrophilic ends. So that is what we call a misel. Now this is the same scenario in plasma membranes. You have the hydrophilic ends outside and then the hydrophilic ends outside then separated by the hydrocarbon tails. That is why we say the, the phospholipids form a bilayer in plasma membrane. We're already getting the idea that plasma membranes uh, uh, have uh, lipids are indispensable to make the tension and the structure of the plasma membrane what we have and study. Now, the phospholipids and, and glycolipids are molecules of biological membranes and they, are, uh, are made of, uh, they make up biological membranes. Phospholipids, glycolipids. And remember that glycolipids is now lipid plus a, a glucose residue. And phospholipids is, is, the, is now the phospho and two long tails of uh, fatty acid residue. So they make up plasma membranes. Like soap, these molecules are highly amphipathic. And when mixed with water spontaneously, they, they form membranes that are described as bilipid layers or lipid layers, lipid bilayers. Lipid bilayers. So we have lipid bilayers. It's the same structure I was trying to show you here. So you see that in that case of the plasma membrane, it's a lipid bilayer, especially when they come in contact. Now this is a typical structure of a plasma membrane. And this model is called the Fritz mosaic model. model. We are still going to um, uh, study this in detail in, in, when we look at cell structure and function. But for the purpose of lipids, let's mention it here. Now there are two types of plasma membrane model. There is the one proposed by Daniel and Jepsen that talks about a biomolecular uh, 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 layer of lipid sandwiched by protein. But the phospholipid model talks about the biomolecular bilayer of lipids, uh, not sandwiched with protein, but integrated with proteins. They are intrinsic proteins. This is protein partly buried in the membrane and partly outside. So you have the, some that are intrinsic in the membrane. You have some that are extrinsic. So the extrinsic proteins and they are intrinsic proteins. So these extrinsic proteins are peripheral proteins and the intrinsic proteins are integral proteins. So you see that attached to the integral proteins are long chain glycocalyx. So these ones are receptor molecules. These ones are receptor molecules. So they attach themselves onto this uh, model. So you have uh, a typical plasma membrane that has integral proteins and peripheral proteins, but the bilayer of phospholipid is there, uh, and the, you have the, the amphipathic nature. So you have now here the hydrophilic uh, ends, water loving. You have here the hydrophobic ends. So the hydrophobic ends face each other, and the hydrophilic uh, ends face the water. So that is a typical uh, biphosphate layer of a plasma membrane. Now, there are many types of phospholipids. So, I'll mention two types here. There is glycerophospholipids. Now, if you look at the glycerophospholipids, it's because of the glycerol, the two molecules of fatty acid, but there is a phosphate and then an alcohol attached to the phosphate. So, it becomes a glycerophosphate. So, glycerophosphates are common in the cell. There are still parts of the plasma membrane. So, the, the, there are still parts of the plasma membrane, but the structure is a bit more complicated than normal phospholipids. So they make up the membrane. And in the membrane, we also have cholesterol, cholesterol that helps in the flexibility, and the carbohydrate chains that help in communication. These are the carbohydrate chains. This one, the glycocalyx, that the carbohydrate chains attached to the integral proteins. 
And when they attach there, they help in cell signaling. That's communication. When something wants to cross the cell, they must first receive the, 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 and transmit the, the information. So we have them communicative uh, 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 molecules. Now you have glycero. The glycerophospholipids have a, 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 a structure uh, similar to triglycerides, as I was saying, with one fatty acid more re replaced with a phosphate and then an alcohol attached to it. Then the bonds are phosphodiester bonds. So the bonds that link them are called the phosphodiester bond. Remember that the whole bond, we see a variety of bonds, and we're going to see some again. When we we'll look at proteins, we're going to see a variety of bonds. Because the bonds hold these molecules together so they can perform their biological function. Phospholipids are commercially emulsifying agents. And emulsifying agents stabilizes an emulsion. So we use them in many industrial processes for emulsification. And emulsion is a cordial suspension of one liquid on another. So mixtures in industries, are, many liquids are mixed. And then they use these phospholipids to stabilize that emulsion. So that is important. So um, an example of such uh, a phospholipid use, is used is, uh, is uh, uh, mayonnaise, which is a cordial suspension of oil and water. So in mayonnaise, there is a phospholipid um, emulsifier that is put in that uh, in the process of producing mayonnaise. Remember, today you can produce mayonnaise at home. You can produce mayonnaise at home. Another very important complex lipid is lecithin. And lecithin is a phospholipid, um, a phospholipid phosphatidyl choline. So it's a complicated lipid. It's a phospholipid, there's, phos there's, a, there's phosph a phosphatidyl, and there is another com compound, choline. Remember that the word choline comes also, we will see it in the nervous system, acetylcholine. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a compound that helps in the functioning of the cell. But lecithins are more complicated and um, they help also in brain function. So this is phospholipid, for the phospholipid phosphatidylcholine that is used as, a, as an emulsifying agent in the preparation of uh, mayonnaise and other food substances. Now there is fingolipids. Fingolipids, look at it. It has glycerol, one fatty acid, and now replaced by uh, uh, sphingosine, and then there's phosphate and there's alcohol. So there is a replacement of the other fatty acid we saw. Now look at it again. See, this other fatty acid we saw here, there were two fatty acid molecules in this glycerophosphate, uh, phospholipids. But in the case of uh, uh, sphingoline, uh, we have uh, sphingolipids, we have only one fatty acid molecule, and sph uh, sphingosine replaces that one. There's still the phosphate and there's alcohol. And they play a role, sphingolipids play a role in cell recognition, adhesion, and acts as a receptor for toxins. So when we go into digital study, we're going to see specifically how they act as receptors. Other complex lipids that of interest are the steroids. Remember that when we look at reprodu study reproduction future, we're going to look, see things like uh, oestrogen, we're going to see progesterone. These are hum uh, hormones in the, in the human reproductive system. All those hormones are steroids. So it is very important for human reproduction. If those hormones are not there, there will be no ovulation. If those hormones are not there, they will not be released. So they are steroids. They are a type of lipid um, that is not derived from fatty acid. They are based instead on a system of five uh, cyclohexanes. That's a bit, um, cyclohexane rings that are fused together. Now you look at those rings. You see steroid uh, skeletal structure. You have a hexagonal ring, three hexagonal rings, and one pentagonal ring. So not to bother you about the detail, how the molecules are attached, but we're interested in just the complicated shape. Three hexagonal rings and one pentagonal ring. But remember, steroids are not like phospholipids. They're not derived from fatty acids. And their role in the system is that they form a lot of hormones. One of the, uh, one of the uh, steroids is cholesterol, and it's found in animals. And cholesterol is uh, found in membranes to keep them fluid. So to keep them fluid. And uh, this cholesterol uh, helps membrane function. Now we have glycolipids. Glycolipids are complex lipids that comprise carbohydrates, fatty acids, and uh, sphingolipids or glycerol group. This is again more complicated. But glycolipids are found uh, in the membrane system. Glycocalyx is a glycolipid. 
We saw it already attached to the intrinsic uh, into integral proteins. So these glycolipids are also components of the plasma membrane. They contain one or more polysaccharide residues bound by a glycosidic uh, um, bond or linkage. So glycolipids are also integral parts of plasma membrane. They perform many other functions within the cell. Now what are the general functions of glycolipids? It provides energy to the cells, essential part of the membrane. I told you that they attach uh, onto the integ integral proteins. Uh, it helps determine, to determine the blood group of an individual. So glycolipids are important. It acts as receptors at the surface of red blood cells. Remember that red blood cells have receptors. They have receptors. It also, you know, when, when, blood, when blood is transfused into an individual and there's a reaction, it's because of the glycolipids on the red blood cell membrane. So we we'll talk about agglutination. So it can cause and control agglutination. It also functions by assisting the immune system by destroying and eliminating pathogens. That's what I was just saying. So there is antigen antibody reaction, and most of the antigens on the red blood cell plasma membranes are of the glycolipid, uh, glycolipid origin. Now we have another group of complex lipids, the waxes. The waxes are esters. Remember the esters, you remember the word esterification. Esters are long chain fatty acids and um, uh, 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 formed with a, uh, um, a, a reaction between uh, uh, the long chain fatty acids and glycerol. They form esters. So esters can be solid at room temperature and they are insoluble in water. B wax is, a, uh, is an example of a, a wax and there are a lot of industrial uses of bee wax. Then you have ear wax, the what, what you can clean out of your ear is also a wax. And the cuticle of the leaf is always described as a waxy cuticle. So when you touch the leaf, it is um, a bit um, uh, hard because of wax. So wax function in protection. When wax is in the ear, it forms a first line of defense for pathogens not to enter uh, your ear. So it's the first line of defense for the immune system. So wax is important. The bee wax can be used to produce polish. Uh, it can be used to produce polish. And then the cuticle of the leaf prevents evaporation of water. It prevents evaporation of water from the leaves. So the bee wax is very important. Now let us go back to our real life situation. Uh, our real estate complex lipids are used daily to ease our life. We have seen now the case of soap. We have seen the case of waxes that they help to maintain insulation, energy storage, protection, and cellular communication. Without all this functioning of the organism helped by lipids, then our, the, life of, the human life would not, be, and, uh, would not go smoothly. So we can say that practically, we are, lipids are involved in our daily, our daily living, our daily structure to keep us uh, strong and healthy. So it is very important. Now, our hypothesis, which one should we upheld? We upheld the, the alternative hypothesis that lipids are responsible for contributing to membrane tension, rigidity, and overall shape. We upheld that hypothesis because we've seen lipids in plasma membrane. We have seen lipids, uh, phospholipids, and cholesterol in plasma membranes. So without these lipids, the plasma membrane structure will no more be a biphosphate layer and an integral protein. So it will not be. There will be no way for the proteins to insert, and, uh, and, and, um, as we saw. So we see that um, the plasma membrane, that's it, the plasma membrane has lipids. So without the lipids, the plasma membrane cannot function. And if the plasma membrane is not in an organism, many things will, will go wrong. Many things will go wrong. So lipids are so important, are so important in cell life function, communication, protection, insulation, storage, and um, we can make soap, we can make shoe polish. So we accept that uh, real life situation, and we also upheld the alternative hypothesis that lipids are responsible for contributing to membrane tension, rigidity, and overall shape. I will give you, leave you an assignment for next class, and the assignment will be to describe the relationship between uh, uh, that exists between uh, lipids and cardiovascular disease. We're coming back to that because we're treating some biological molecules and their impact on health is greatly 
um, is greatly now more and more understood. There are references you can read. After the lecture, look for books and read them. Go to the internet and look for these resources so that they may help you to be able to get more knowledge, expand your knowledge. And um, uh, we've come to the end of our lessons. And our next lesson, we're going to look at uh, flashback to look at revision and integration of the first 23 lessons that we've had. Tam tam atonge tam zabike tam 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 amote tam zabike mane tambia ninya ne injo biyen